Hello and welcome. Today we are going to be talking about fonts and typography. I am not a graphic designer or typographer, so please don't take this as an expert bestowing knowledge, more like we are learning together. But I find fonts interesting as a form of visual expression. They're also a key part in how messages are transmitted and received by the viewer. So we're just going to look at some different aspects of fonts, learn a little bit about letters, some of the terminology, and then look at some specific fonts throughout history of historical interest or just because I think they're intriguing. We'll look at a variety of those. So let's go ahead and get started. I am going to be using a couple of books that have been sources of knowledge for me and to help with some of these pieces of information about type. The first is Designing with Type by James Craig and Irene Coral Scala. It is a very helpful introduction to using type and learning about different aspects of it. I'm going to start by looking at some of the basic terms we use to describe a typeface or parts of the letters within that typeface. So we will look here. We'll start, I'm sure all of us are familiar with uppercase and lowercase letters. The letters, notably all of the capital uppercase letters, sit upon the base line. Most of the lowercase letters do not reach as high as uppercase letters. They reach up to what is called the mean line. And the mean line is placed at the X height. The X height is the height of lowercase letters, specifically, literally, the letter X. So letters like A and E are the same height as the X height. They reach from the baseline to the mean line. Some lowercase letters like P or G extend below the baseline with what are called descenders. Similarly, letters like B have an ascender which reaches above the mean line. One detail I hadn't really ever noticed is that in many fonts the lowercase letters with ascenders, the tall ones like L, can actually be taller than the height of the capitals. It depends on the font. The area inside of letters like E is called the counter. This font is a serif font in that it has these little lines at the base of letters like the A and the H and at the top of those letters. Serifs are just these little lines at the end of the letters. They often are what distinguishes between different fonts. And if a font does not have 
those serifs, say sans serif font, which really came into being more in modern times. I think one of the things that is interesting about font, I don't always think about, is that it is much of the terminology and ways we talk about and use them are based on actual printing, physical printing of ink onto paper, where fonts were really first created in order to serve the printing press. So let's look at a little bit of additional terminology about how we talk about fonts in printing. So when you have a word, there is the letter spacing, the space between letters. When you are adjusting the spacing of all letters in a word, you are changing the tracking. When you change the space between two specific letters, that is called kerning. And this is typically done for certain letter combinations that if they were given the normal letter spacing look a little bit awkward. Like A and T, kerning would slide the A over in order to look more visually correct to our eyes. The space between lines is called leading, and this comes from printing presses where in the early days literally strips of lead were inserted into the press to change the difference between difference in the space between rows of letters. The size of type, we talk about 10 point type or 16 point type, also stems from the days of actual printing presses and the metal blocks had letters carved on them that would do the printing. Each letter was set into a block. And each of those blocks had to be the same vertical height to form the row of letters. So I guess it's somewhat common, but I often thought of in my head, point spacing as being just the height of a capital letter. This is not true because when you have lowercase letters with descenders, those also would need to fit on that same height block. So the point size is actually the size of the block that would be sized to fit all of the letters and have those nice even rows of type then have letting to space them between the next row. So type size is measured in points. There are 12 points per pica. A pica is another unit of measurement used in printing. It is typically used to measure the length of a line of text. There are six picas in one inch. About one sixth of in an inch is one pica. And there are 12 points in each of those. So 12 point type is about one sixth of an inch. And that would be the height of the blocks that were originally used to print that type size. Commonly, type size ranged from five point to 72 point. And this again was a physical limitation. Five point type would be too small to finely carve details that would distinguish the letters. 
And as you got up past 72 point, the metal blocks would become too heavy for the press and they would switch to wood blocks for the printing. So metal type is typically from five to 72 points. And now we see larger sizes in our computers, but still that is often a range that you will see stemming from those old limitations. Fonts have evolved over the centuries since the time of Gutenberg and other printers who pioneered printing with movable type. There are some general classifications of typefaces. And I think for the non-artist like myself, the differences are often subtle in terms of distinguishing them. So there can be a lot of similarities and many of newer typefaces have their roots in the older typefaces, just with evolution based on style and often technology. Some classifications given by this book, which are fairly common, old style, which was what was used in the earliest printing presses, which generally had stroke widths in the letters that were about the same size. Transitional was when there began to be more differentiation in the width of strokes, such as horizontal and vertical, and starting to have more shape uh, in the serifs, or slimming down serifs over time. Modern typefaces. This is more like a couple hundred years ago rather than recently when we say modern. Uh, has a lot more of that contrast between strokes and started to use more and more fine serifs. So we have old style type. It will be probably hard to see, but a more modern face like lines like the vertical lines in the M. Some might be very thin and some thicker, whereas in older typefaces, those would be more consistent. An additional category of type is a slab serif, sometimes also called Egyptian, which I believe mostly was a name given at a time when Egyptian artifacts and culture was popular in the wider European culture and someone applied that name to it. But a slab serif font has serifs that are very blocky. They're essentially even rectangles instead of being curved lines or very fine And then, as I mentioned, we have sans serif, where serifs were eliminated completely from the font. This has become probably the most dominant typeface that we are familiar with, outside of reading in books, where serif fonts are still used for printing. Decorative or novelty fonts are more creatively designed fonts. And we have script fonts, which resemble cursive handwriting, and black letter, which really comes from Germany in the early days of printing. These sort of very strong, dramatic, and angular letter forms. Lastly, there are ornaments, which can be used creatively in a lot of different ways. Historically, when you think about where printing came from, monks producing manuscripts, and they often drew elaborate ornamented letters to start paragraphs or pages 
of a historical version of more ornamental type. Those are some of the basics. And now we're going to look at some more specific typefaces throughout history. We will be using this monster tome called Type, the Visual History of Type, by Paul McNeil. This is a beautiful book. It is a collection of many thoughts, their evolution throughout history, notes on their design, where they came from, and examples. We will start with Gutenberg, who is credited with being the first to invent movable type, though several other people were doing it, but he certainly achieved great success with a number of innovations that helped make it successful and produced quality work. His type that he used in this case is called a bastarda, which often was used for more secular works um, than another typeface that he used often for more specific religious works, um, though both could be used interchangeably. And what I think is interesting and hadn't really occurred to me, but the origin of this typeface was directly based off of the handwriting of monks, who at that time were the ones who would produce manuscripts by copying them by hand. So he created a movable type version of a similar script. Creating a similar work was a man named Nicholas Jensen. And he created a typeface that to our modern eyes is a little bit more readable. It looks a lot more like our modern typefaces, ones we call Roman. And this one is interesting because over the centuries since its creation in the 1400s, different fonts have often been created with it as the base, including ones still in use today. This is Nicholas Grifo's Italic. It is the first real printed italic typeface. We can trace our use of italics back to his work. Here we have Wagner's Fracture, Fraktur, probably in German. This is a black letter font based on more what was happening in Germany. I think this is the sort of font that many of us probably have strong visual associations. We immediately start to think of Germany when we see a font of this style. Fonts can be very evocative based on their history and how they were used. Moving forward to the end of the 1600s, you have the Roman du Roy. Coming from France, this was an effort to produce a standardized national alphabet. What was unique about it 
was that instead of being based on handwriting, it was intentionally constructed on grids that would define the sizes and shapes of letter forms. While this font didn't necessarily achieve great success in its aim, it did really lay the foundation for what would happen later on, especially in the 20th century, when more geometric design and specifically crafted fonts not based on handwriting were developed. This is Caslon. It was developed by an Englishman, and it was really the first big successful English typeface. It was similar in many ways to other styles that were being used, but it really helped kick forward the English printing industry. I think many of us have probably seen or are familiar with modern versions of Caslon based on this font from the 1700s. Now we are moving forward to a more modern font, a font that was significant in advancing to more of this modern style. Which I pronounce it Dido. I don't actually know the correct pronunciation. People who speak French can chime in. But this font really had a very strong contrast between the widths of strokes, which is part of what marks it as very modern. Like we mentioned, things like the M having very, very fine lines mixed with thicker lines and more delicate serifs on the font. Bodoni is a very similar font that came out very shortly afterwards. It also achieved great success and is still being used today. But these really helped move typography into the future, the past, depending on how you want to look at it. I think one thing that's interesting about fonts is their role in society. Often a lot of the changes in Europe with the Renaissance are attributed to more widespread reading based on the printed press where more works could be produced than just those copied by monks, making reading more accessible, likely playing a large part and many cultural shifts that happened as a result. Similarly, the rapid growth of industrialization in the 19th century, you started to get fonts that were really serving the purpose of advertising this dramatic fat face really grabbed attention on posters as businesses competed for their customer. In some ways, you could probably say this was the beginning of more modern advertising for products and fonts that were dramatic or eye-catching like this one could grab the attention of a potential customer. As a result, Many purists and designers of type were horrified or thought these were terrible designs, but they served their purpose for those using them. As we start to approach the 20th century, then we start to talk about where sans serif fonts come from. And because there were many different competing type foundries producing typefaces and because there weren't good copyright laws or protections of those things, they were often widely copied, particularly if something was successful. So we don't necessarily have a pinpoint view of 
what was the first or what really kicked this off, but we do know fonts like this one, Akadense, grotesque, which is kind of a European or Swiss name for sans serif, uh, was a clear example of a font that had eliminated serifs, aiming for clarity and for readable display. And this one in particular is significant because many of the most famous serif fonts of the 20th century, the ones we'll get to, which are probably household names, even for non-graphic designers, actually went back and looked and used accidents, grotesque, as their initial model. Copper plate Gothic. It derived from literal engravings on copper plates being used in advertising at the time. But it is a distinctive font, and I think we probably all recognize it because we still see this on things like business cards. It conveys a certain authority and a certain style that works well for that. Here we have Gaudi old style. This was released early in the 20th century. It's a very classic looking font. He drew it freehand, but it was no doubt inspired by some of those early Italian fonts. I show it here just because it is probably one of the most used typefaces in history. It's proved very popular over the years, and we have seen it everywhere. This is another font that marked a significant point somewhat like the Roman de Roy in a way. This is what is called Johnston's railway type. And it was specifically designed for the London underground. It was a from scratch design intended to maximize the legibility for signage to be used with the trains. This kind of approach would be used much more in the 20th century. But he created an extremely readable font for use on the signs in the underground. And I believe it was used basically for about a hundred years. Here we have one of the most famous fonts of all time, Futura. It was designed as a very geometric font, starting with squares and circles to form the shape of the letter forms. We have seen this everywhere. It is in airplane cockpits, on advertising posters, the plaque that was left on the moon by the Apollo 11 astronauts used this font. It was an incredibly significant sans serif font that definitely helped sort of supercharge and launch their widespread usage in the 20th century. Next up, well, also a sans serif font, one with a very different feel. This is called Broadway, which makes sense. I think we definitely can associate it with Broadway and New York of the 1920s. It has a very modern styling with 
extremely thick strokes mixed with very, very thin strokes. One of the interesting quirks to me is how like the O is filled with a straight line rather than being fully curved inside of the O. Same with the D. This is an example of a font that it definitely evokes a certain time period in our minds, the 1920s and the jazz age. And then designers, artists, movie makers may want to evoke that era, so they use the font, knowing it will trigger that, and that sort of then leads to it being a little bit of a, a trope or kind of self-reinforcing idea but we definitely have these strong associations often with different fonts and things that they make us think of as a result of their style or how they were used in the past. This is an interesting font. It's called Bifur. Is a very, very modern font, geometric. It is almost a piece of design art in itself. A radically different approach to making the letters, where sometimes where we'd expect solid strokes, they're just gray lines or yellow. It was designed to make a splash in you know, posters and pamphlets and other things that were trying to attract attention. It was kind of its own little piece of design art. It wasn't hugely popular, but really interesting style. Next up, we have Times New Roman, which everyone will be familiar with. For a long time, it was the default in Microsoft products. Its origin was actually with the London Times, which commissioned a font for their newspaper which they would use throughout the 20th century. Again, one of the most widely used and seen fonts of all time. Here we have Courier, which you likely also know from computer systems. But it was originally designed as a typewriter font for IBM. The interesting thing about it is that it is a monospaced font. In most fonts, different letters have different widths. An M is much wider than an I. We actually measure distance, like for a space, it's like an M space or an N space, for how big that is based on that letter width. Courier is a little bit different because it was designed to be used on a typewriter where every key had the same width. So every single letter, punctuation mark, and space in the font has the same space, or same width. This was actually used in applications like screenplays, where using a certain format, the length of a scene on film could correspond pretty directly with the number of pages, because Courier had a very consistent spacing for its letters. They would make that predictable. And here we have arguably the most famous font of all time, Helvetica. It is pretty much a household name at this point. It was one of those fonts that was based off of Accidents Grotesque. It was a very clean and strong form to the letters. It has a tall X height. So the lowercase letters are tall relative to the capital letters. Because it was such a well-designed, clean and strong looking font, it became hugely popular in the second half of the 20th century, influencing type and design ever since. It is used so often 
has become a cliche in some ways. It is a font that has its own film you can watch on its history, which is an interesting film. Designed by Max Meetinger, it has really taken over the world and is hard to avoid. A similar font with similar origins is Universe by Adrian Frutiger. It has a lot of the properties of Helvetica, but has a nice readable elegance to it as well. This is Impact. It is another very recognizable font. It was meant to stand out in advertising. Again, it has a very tall X height, which helps create some of that dramatic effect. The letters looking large it is very bold and impactful. As such, it seems a bit of a cliche too, since it was so widely used for things like movie titles and advertising. And we tend to have strong associations with it. This is another example of a font called Artone. It could be Art One. I don't actually know. There's a very dramatic font, very stylized. These huge slab serifs on the bottom. But again, it is a type of font that evokes a very specific time period, the 1970s we kind of imagine this sort of imagery. This is an interesting font, also designed by Adrian Frutiger, designed Universe. It's actually two fonts, OCRA and OCRB. They look very machine or computer-like, and that is by design. OCR actually stands for Optical Character Recognition. These fonts were designed so that machines could easily identify text written in them, which had many applications. So they were specifically designed to be used by machines, yet readable by people in the way that a barcode, for instance, is readable, is not, and that is readable by machines, but not really by humans. Playing on some of those ideas, we have Data 70. I think it's the type of font we see a lot associated with video games or other computer applications in entertainment. It just has that look to it as kind of a designed adaptation of machine-readable fonts. The last font we're going to look at is called Chicago. If you used a Macintosh in the early days, this will be extremely familiar. It was a font that was designed to display the limited pixels available, yet still be highly legible, trying to bring good typography principles to computers in order to make a nicely readable font within the technical limitations. So that is a brief journey through a monstrous tome through all the history of typography, but I hope you found it interesting. If you have favorite fonts or questions, definitely put them in the comments below, and I hope you have a nice evening. See ya.